legado desses quatro anos é que a gente incrivelmente conseguiu mais do que a gente imaginava. de abrir suas portas para um público diverso. Que leve em consideração o contato com o público e poder criar essa programação com eles. E que eles possam sair com o sentimento de pertencimento. De aproximação, de criação de afeto. O foco da governança do Museu da Manhã e do IDG está em entregar para o nosso público o melhor produto possível. O Museu do Amanhã recebeu hoje em Londres o Leading Culture Destinations Award. Considerado simplesmente o Oscar dos museus. Porque a atividade de fim do museu é pessoas. que nós queremos oferecer para cada um dos visitantes que vem aqui é, conhecer o Museu da Manhã. Olá a todos, bem-vindos e bem-vindas ao Museu do Amanhã. Continuamos nossa programação digital entrevistando grandes personalidades, pensadores, artistas e pessoas que fazem a diferença com a sua pesquisa, sua ação, sua arte. Hoje temos a honra de conversar com o filósofo e antropólogo francês Bruno Latour. Mr. Latour, thank you for having this conversation with us. Thank I you. have read your books. It's definitely an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Doutor em filosofia e antropologia, Latour publicou mais de 20 livros, entre eles Jamais Fomos Modernos, investigações sobre os modos de existência, políticas da natureza e ensaios sobre a realidade dos estudos científicos. Foi um dos curadores da Bienal de Taipei, em 2010, e curador de exposições como Iconoclast, além das guerras é, de imagens na ciência, religião e arte, e recentemente a exposição Zonas Críticas, Observatórios para Políticas Terrenas, ambas exibidas na Alemanha. Seu novo livro se chama Onde Aterrar? Como Se Orientar Politicamente no Antropoceno, lançado no Brasil pela editora Bazar do Tempo. Antropoceno significa época dos humanos, um conceito debatido por pesquisadores que estudam como as atividades humanas, nas últimas décadas, se tornaram uma força de magnitude geológica, reformulando o nosso planeta a uma velocidade acelerada. Conceito este que nomeia a área central da exposição principal do Museu do Amanhã. No pensamento de Latour, a civilização humana enfrenta hoje várias zonas críticas, como a situação de pandemia pelo novo coronavírus e outras que podem se tornar ainda mais complexas no futuro devido às crises climáticas. Para, para analisar como esses desafios podem impactar as sociedades atuais e futuras, Bruno Latour tem escrito, por exemplo, sobre a pandemia e sua relação com o projeto moderno que instalamos sobre o mundo nas últimas décadas, indiferente aos limites ambientais. Quais novas atitudes cidadãs e cuidados com as formas de vida são necessários para gerar um cenário próspero para a maioria dos seres vivos? Nesta entrevista para o Museu da Manhã, Bruno conversará conosco sobre a necessidade de uma nova relação entre as pessoas e o mundo natural, a fim de diminuir os efeitos das mudanças climáticas nos ecossistemas e, em última instância, em nós mesmos. Mr. Latour, you have recently launched a book in Brazil named Down to Earth Politics in the New Climate Regime, a few, year, a few years later than Europe. Your work has been serving as a reference for discussions and projects in, the field, in fields as diverse as the humanities, sciences and arts. If the new climatic regime, a sort of a new world pol political order, according to ACNUR, the UN Agency for Refugees, might set the largest migration wave ever in the near future. This year, we also have witnessed the migration of viruses worldwide due to the fast globalization structure, 
connecting most of the planet regions. With millions of people infected, this perverse universality, as you mentioned, has made many researchers rethink about some concepts that can serve as a compass to guide us in these uncertain times. The Anthropocene, for instance, is a disputed one, one which we in the Museum of Tomorrow use to name a whole area of our main exhibition, a central part uh, to it, representing the moment of today, the spirit of humans, when the sum of our activities collectively has altogether the geological power to transform the planets. But for you, the hypothesis of Gaia, another concept, for example, has influenced many researchers who try to explain the transformation of our planets, often describing Earth as an organism. As on the human level, we are all able to experience our own planets uh, is within a few kilometers up and down from the soil. The critical zone, as you present them, a fragile and somewhat difficult to comprehend place due to its heterogeneity. My first questions. How the ideas of James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis about the Earth systems being configured by billions of years of life forms have inspired you to think about the critical zones? And in this sense, how the critical zones are also reconfigured by the way we humans are affecting the planet's fluxes intensely in the last decades. Well, um, thank you for the questions um, and thank you for interviewing me in the Museum of the Future. I mean, it's somewhat reassuring that there are people who are thinking in the future and betting on them, so to speak. Um, critical Zone and Gaia are related, but uh, it's it's a different uh, grasp, so to speak. Uh, critical zone is actually uh, a connection of discipline. Um, soil science, very important in Brazil, but also uh, hydrology and, of course, biochemistry, uh, but also uh, the sciences of a, si of a shape uh, of a landscape and so on and so forth. It, it's more like a, a mot d'ordre, a slogan, so to speak, to, to keep together the disciplines which uh, before were uh, partitioning, so to speak, uh, the, the, the topic. And second critical zone, in my <laughs> understanding of it, I'm doing an exhibit on that in, in, in Karlsruhe in Germany, uh, is a shift in understanding uh, our own uh, cosmology, so to speak. And that, that's where it gains uh, a sort of anthropological or, or philosophical uh, weight, which is not, of course, the, go the goal of a scientist I've, I've been studying and cooperating with. Now, Gaia is different because uh, Gaia introduced a key notion, not of superorganism, because there is no superorganism, but uh, of the fact that life forms, I mean, organisms have produced their own environment over the years. And when I say over the years, as you said, it's really billions of years. So Gaia is um, a very important uh, scientific concept, but since it has a mythical name, I've been interested in pushing uh, it further. Um, and I think it's a name for what uh, I call, as you said, uh, the new climatic regime, because it, there is something very uh, complicated, very important and very telling in the name of Gaia and in the concept of living forms making their environment, uh, which is what sort of political power do they exert? And is it an alternative to uh, the traditional powers of nature, so to speak, of power of society in, in the modernist uh, period? The, post <laughs> the period before the Anthropocene. So um, all of these concepts are, for me, avenue to the same, uh, and the same problem, so to speak. And trying to understand, since this is what the, the question was about, uh, what is the role of humans into it? I mean, certainly the humans in the Anthropocene don't have the same responsibility, they don't have the same history, they don't have the same localization, the same place, 
as the one uh, of a period before. So this is uh, humans in nature, modern human in nature, and Anthropocene humans in Gaia are completely different type of entities, and uh, and, and and it goes in different directions. Yes, but at the same time, we're living a political scenario that is makes it even more challenging. It seems that political events, uh, as such as Trump election in the U.S. or Brexit, are symptoms of society's relation to the space that they occupy and use, especially uh, through the eyes of the so-called elites or ruling classes. Thus, the, the rise of political populism and its desire to go back to the past, which are imaginary versions of what could be, what would have been the land uh, years ago. Uh, in this way, they are not real countries. But the land of the globalists uh, is just as imaginary because uh, they are, uh, they force an infinite modernization without limits to the right. planet. Uh, why is it not possible to analyze the political power of elites of the last decades without addressing the emergency of climate change and its effects over biomes and even on our concept of space itself? Well, you said it very well. Uh, most people actually, uh, the most commentator of the populism in the US as well as in Brazil actually, uh, or in England or, or France, uh, are not taking into account this extraordinary uh, feature of a question, which is that uh, people don't have the same definition of a planet on which we live. So, uh, I mean, you said it very well. In the, 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 what, what we call populism, I don't think has anything to do with what was populism before, which was a sort of uh, staying with the past. But uh, neither uh, in Brazil nor in the US, it has anything to do with the past exactly. It has something with something else, something out of this world, so to speak, uh, which I call escapism. So in a way, uh, Populism probably uh, describes an attachment to the land, but it's an imaginary land. It's a land which has precisely even less uh, materiality, even less complexity, even less fragility uh, than the one imagined by the globalists uh, who were thinking of sort of horizon of progress and abundance for all. Mm -hmm. uh, so paradoxically, the, the populists who are always talking about the land uh, are actually talking about the land that does not exist. Uh, so this is the responsibility <laughs> that we have. We have two movements, one globalist and the other one, uh, which is not, uh, which is, let's call it populist, uh, who, who, have who are estranged from the land. In spite of the uh, obsession for identity and in spite of the attention for locality and roots, uh, it has no roots, actually, and that's the big problem. The people who talk about roots are uprooted. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that makes political life extremely tense, as you know, mm -hmm. alas, too well in Brazil. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's some sort of also, because due to the superficial contents that they have, they always seem to have an attack uh, situation to it in order not to address the challenges that they have to address, I think, especially in the environmental uh, issues that we are now facing. That it was, you know, the growth of deforestation in the Amazon and also climate changes that are already having its impacts, especially in the low income classes, I think. I think that your book offers also a detailed analysis of the contemporary geopolitical context in that sense. But how could you explain the links of phenomena such as the loosening of governmental or regulations, the explosion of social inequalities, the ecological collapse, climate denial, and the widespread of populism? Those, though, is that those things can be somewhat connected? Well, if you decide to go away and uh, don't care for the place where you are, um, 
basically, I think all these phenomena are related. I mean, historically, there is something happening in the 1980s and 1990s, which has been studied by many people, historians, uh, economists, of course, anthropologists, which is this sudden shift uh, into the way the elite, let's say, I mean, this is not a good word, but uh, feel that they no longer have to play the game of being at the forefront of the whole uh, people. Uh, I mean, basically Reagan uh, time in the US, uh, Thatcher in, 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 in England and so on. I mean, it marks a very clear uh, change in, in uh, taxation, uh, in uh, regulation, in international uh, agreements and so on and so forth. And now we see the end of that uh, period in a way. The end, unfortunately, is even worse than the, <laughs> the beginning, but it's also the end, probably, which is uh, important for a museum of the future to know where the end is. Uh, and this movement has, has certainly uh, triggered, um, I mean, or connected, let's say, uh, a definition of inequality and a definition of economic infinite uh, progress with something which later in the year 2000 uh, became uh, uh, sort of entrenched into uh, denial. But it's not denial of climate only, as we see it with the COVID-19. Uh, it's a general denial. Anyone who talks about anything having to do with the limits uh, of the past uh, has to uh, be uh, contested. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a, it's a generalized dino denial by people who want to stay in their, in their old ways, basically. And uh, so it's not a cognitive denial. It's not a lack of information. It's not a lack of uh, uh, logic or reasoning power. Uh, yes. in, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a generalized denial by people who want to go somewhere else, basically. And that's mm -hmm. very difficult because there is no tradition for that. We don't know how to handle uh, the idea that people live in different land. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not what politics was supposed. Politics was always supposing a sort of basic location which was common to, to the people around. And this is why it's so disorienting and so terribly tense because there's no way to argue. I mean, you cannot argue if you don't live in the same uh, planet, have the same body, are submitted to the same virus and uh, transformed by the same climate, basically. I mean, it's impossible. Yes, it seems that we have, and that was a feeling, I think, in Brazil in the last two years or so, that we are living, we are in at sort of the same space, but we are not living in the same time of the same perspective, I think that societies are feeling divided by that feeling somehow. That's why in your recent works, you propose to build a geosocial class consciousness, an awareness grounded in a territory that unleashes the conflicts necessary for the emergency of a political organization that can respond to the ecological and climate situation. This perspective is accompanied by the diagnosis that no society is answering properly the challenges posed by the ecological and climate shifts. To what extent could the new coronavirus pandemic be an opportunity to leverage uh, this construction of geosocial classes? And what are those classes anyway? Well, that's a difficult question because we have difficulty finding positive aspects to the coronavirus. Uh, it pandemic um, because it's so hard, I mean, so tragic for the people who die and so tragic for uh, the whole people who lose their jobs. Uh, and yet, I mean, I agree with you, it, it, it's important to, to say what can be learned from this catastrophe, so to speak. And what can be learned certainly is a re, uh, reinsertion and uh, refocusing uh, on, on the traditional notion of classes. I mean, it's very clear in Europe where everybody now <laughs> has understood that the hierarchy of jobs uh, changed completely if you lock in everybody and suddenly you realize uh, you need people who are badly paid, who are very often of, of, of color, 
uh, and uh, who are in jobs which are associated with care and not necessarily with banking or uh, doing all sorts of other things. So suddenly there's a, 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 a new uh, consciousness of the old classical uh, class definition. But in addition, of course, uh, and that's what I call geosocial class, there are shifts in the definition uh, of what are your interests when you realize that uh, you have to take care of a virus which is coming from China, uh, or when you realize that you absolutely need uh, trees in this Amazon forest to stay uh, for lots of reasons which have nothing to do with, with uh, trade, but which have a lot to do with the machinery of the planet, uh, and so on and so forth. So, but it, it's still a work in progress because it's not clear yet in which way people are now re-locating uh, themselves differently. But there is something going on uh, in Europe. I don't know how the statistics are in uh, Brazil, but the number of people who want to keep their uh, second house that they wanted to sell, for instance, before the COVID, uh, the people who have uh, committed to uh, um, slow food, or locally grown food and so on and so forth are, is clearly increasing. Now, will it change the way people define their class interest? And will it change the definition of class struggle? Obviously, this is, we are not yet, we are not yet there because of a populist question uh, you raised before, because the populist is, is building a sort of phantasmatic opposition between the people on the land which does not really exist with other people who are supposed to be globalists, uh, who are not supposed to be on any land. And uh, this uh, fantasmatic uh, dispute, so to speak, uh, hide, hides the, the transformation which is going on, where the classes are now shifting uh, because of the uh, Lending, as I said, the, 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 the operation of lending uh, when people realize that they need to take care of many other things uh, which are not just defined by their position in the production system, like in the old Marxist days. So it, it resembles the question of that was raised by socialists, except the definition of the land on which things happen is different. And that's whatever we can uh, get out of a COVID pandemic, uh, something has, has, has sort of made the whole definition of class uh, tremble at least, <laughs> wobble, if not completely metamorphosed. Yes, it seems that this pandemic has also raised many disputes also in the discourse uh, scenario as well. Uh, I, I, we have felt that uh, especially in the beginning, after many waves of fake news, it seems that there is a renewed public interest in the scientific discourse, at least. Well, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that scientific narrative has changed during the, during this pandemic? And how do you see the relationship between scientists and politicians evolving over the next years due to this pandemic situation as well? Well, we... I don't think anything new, uh, I mean, it's a classical misunderstanding between the link between scientists and politics, um, the politics trying to endorse, to make the scientists endorse things they, the politics, want, yeah. and vice versa. I mean, this is as old as science and as old as politics, it goes all the way to uh, the Greek. Um, but what I think what was the learning a uh, curve of the public, uh, certainly you are better uh, placed than me to, because you are in a museum for, for science, um, to check that. But I think on the whole, at least in Europe, where the pandemic is not so hard right now, uh, on the whole, people have learned a lot about uh, the way science functions, uh, aware of the difficulty of, 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 of get, getting objective facts, <laughs> Um, a lot of question about the difficulty of statistics. Uh, so my feeling, but from a European perspective, is that uh, the, the pandemic has been a, a, an education 
uh, of the public uh, about the difficulty and importance and seriousness and cost and institutional uh, support necessary for having a science <coughs> that function. So, in again, this is a question that has been, uh, this learning curve has been sort of wiped out and destroyed by the populist uh, fight. But I think that on the whole, in a, in a, at the end of the year, we, we will realize that people have learned things about science. Yeah, science as practice, of course not science with a capital S, which is, of course, an illusion. Yes, yes. I think that it's, uh, I think that it is also this discourse, we think that hopefully people will be more aware of the importance of science discussions and try to get a better understanding of how science works, especially now that people are looking uh, for a vaccine uh, and trying to understand how the vaccine process also works. But we're always aware in the Museum of Tomorrow at uh, how are people going to have access to those, uh, to those innovations in science. It's not just about the innovation itself, but also about access, because we're seeing an ever-growing inequality in society in, in that sense as well. Um, and then we're, since we're talking about the, the, also the uh, consequences of the pandemic, I'm not aware if in Europe the use of masks during uh, the pandemic, uh, during this pandemic, uh, has had a political symbolism to it. But here in Brazil, some followers of the extreme right-wing presidents are, just as him, not wearing any masks in the streets. Uh, it is as if they were inhabiting another world where uh, the virus is not to be feared. Uh, denying all the scientific and health organizations' guidelines. Uh, if, is it still possible to construct a common development horizon towards where the majority of the population can agree with? And if so, how to build it, this horizon in common? <laughs> uh, it's the same in the US, actually. Uh, mask has become a signal, but not wearing masks has become a signal of individualism yes. and the decision. Um, and I think you're right, it, it's, it's in a small scale, the same decision as the one that the US uh, made of being and moving to another planet. Uh, it's also interestingly means that uh, you don't want to be dependent on, on so many non-human entities and the virus is one and the climate uh, is another. So there is, it, 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 it is, a, I don't think you can really build a pedagogical um, trajectory to convince people uh, because it's not cognitive again. It's not about the lack of understanding. Uh, it, it's, it's a decision not to listen to anything which is uh, adjusted or uh, uh, part uh, of this, uh, what they call a conspiracy, um, to uh, keep, to take to, to bring them back, so to speak, uh, to a world where they would be dependent. I mean, in the U.S., they are amazing. Uh, I don't speak enough Portuguese, but there isn't enough. I, I watch a lot of uh, these amazing numbers of videos where you see people protesting against the mask, the mask in the name of. I mean, God, uh, freedom, the Republic, Constitution, and so on, with, with an immense energy, which is difficult to understand. I mean, it's not just derision, it's not fun, it's not indifference, it's really uh, aggressive, uh, as if they were uh, fighting for their life, even though they work for the life against the life of their federal citizens. They are exposing themselves and they say that they are fighting against that. <laughs> How to understand that? And they probably have a helmet when they go and they take uh, their bicycle. So, or they secure the, 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 the belt uh, when they take in, inside their car. Yeah. Their safety belt. So it's very, very odd. It's, it's a... I don't know if we'd last very much because it's so bizarre. Uh, 
it, it, it's 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 really about moving to another uh, planet. But how long can you think you live in another planet? That's the question. I mean, mm -hmm. inequality is so big that it doesn't. See, this is a big primer. I mean, it's the same in Brazil as in the US. But when inequality is so big, you cannot build any common world mm -hmm. because before you have a conversation between reasonable people, as it was said in the past, uh, it was because people didn't have uh, immensely different salaries. They didn't live in completely different places uh, in the cities and so on and so forth. We, we, we always attribute to rationality uh, things which are actually due to the institutional setup in which people can actually speak to one another. But uh, because of a conservative revolution in the US, because of Fox News essentially, actually in the US, uh, and the equivalent of Fox News in, in uh, Brazil, um, this is not no longer a question of let's speak to them and have a conversation, <laughs> obviously. I mean, you must know that very well mm -hmm. uh, as a museum because it's not no longer agreeing to dissent which was the old way to basically go by uh, and have a modus vivendi. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a war of extermination mm -hmm. and um, or termination of a link. I mean, it's, it's a war of separating to another planet. You and us um, are not of the same type of people. And it's true in a way. <laughs> Uh, because living on Earth and living out of Earth is two different things. Yeah. So this is why the, the, the land, the, the space question, the where where you are in space and what you expect from the future and what we know from the past uh, has become anthropologically uh, so important. And, and it's so dividing in a way. But still, I mean, I, I teach and I try to do <laughs> a lot of things to to make uh, people understand but it, it's not just understanding it's actually a way of life yeah sure uh, and in saying that you're trying to create dialogue in a society that is not up for any conversation at the moment you created uh the platform uh where to land after the pandemic which proposes oh, yeah. a set of individual and collective questions and actions that can fun function as gestures to stop the return to modes and rhythms of production before the, the current sanitary uh, and economic crisis. And recently, the exhibition Critical Zones, Observatories of Earthly Politics opened uh, and is going to reopen soon, uh, of which you are the curator. An exhibition whose motto uh, is this thin and complex layer called the Critical Zone where all forms of life on Earth co cohabit. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit about those two projects and the possible connections between them in this, in this singularly critical moments that we are experience, re experiencing right now? Uh, my uh, hunch is that, building on your former question, uh, since conversation, I mean, polite conversation is impossible. Uh, it means that the divide is so big that you need to uh, touch something else, which is uh, gut feelings, uh, emotions, uh, basically everything which would have been understood by an anthropologist as a uh, um, cultural setting, so to speak. And uh, it's true that being moved from being a modernist to someone uh, who lives uh, on an earth which is the critical zone earth is difficult and uh, is a change of cosmology and is something which is as troubling for people as was the case uh, in the 16th century or the 17th century uh, with the discovery of, of America. Uh, and and with the change in the planet moving uh, with the scientific revolution. So it, it is uh, a change of this magnitude, so to speak. So it explains also why people react so seriously. 
And uh, I have tried to multiply the entry uh, in addition to discussing and arguing and publishing uh, through uh, theater, which I think is very important. Theater is a very powerful uh, medium. Uh, and exhibition, I've done several uh, big exhibitions. And this one in, in Karlsruhe in, on Critical Zone is uh, about uh, finding other ways of people to see and feel and be moved by the change in cosmology. And um, the detailed questionnaire <laughs> which, which, uh, that you mentioned and which is used in the uh, platform that we devised in, in my lab uh, has the same goal, which is, okay, uh, you are locked in, uh, you have some time, uh, maybe there are lots of things you don't want to see uh, starting again. Let's take the time to think uh, without being pressured by the idea that there is only one uh, line of development uh, and, and that we can move around. So it, it's always trying to find uh, alternative tools, so to speak, uh, alternative, uh, how do say, entries into this uh, traumatic experience of landing on Earth. <laughs> Uh, and I'm doing an exhi another exhibition in Taipei in November called directly, uh, you and I don't live on the same planet. Uh, precisely to find something which recognizes the state of wars in which we are and, and trying to find another uh, way to, to at least look at the scale of a disagreement. Because again, they are not cognitive disagreements. The same people who are wearing no masks have a helmet when we get into the on the bicycle, so it, it it's a decision that uh, of living on another world on on another planet, uh, which makes the, the dissension uh, so strong. Sure. So uh, in your recent works as a curator of exhibitions, since we are also a museum, so I'm kind of curious about it. Uh, what are, what do you think are the gains uh, that you see in this type of medium of exhibitions to express your ideas compared to articles and other works and theater, as you mentioned? And what types of strategies have you came up uh, to make visitors realize that they are living uh, within these critical zones and they, that they have to act upon it somehow? Well, as you know very well, exhibition is a powerful medium um, because people move through the space, uh, experience uh, the, the, the thing you don't only have to talk about uh, or show on a, on a slide, uh, but also because, and I think that's exactly why <laughs> Critical Zones uh, works as an exhibition, even though because of the COVID I have not seen it yet. Uh, which is paradoxical. We, we devise an exhibition, but <laughs> I haven't, haven't seen it yeah. uh, because we were not allowed to go to Germany. Which, which yeah. Anyway, uh, what you see when you move into the uh, exhibition, you feel, and this is why, how we design it, uh, the, the very change of cosmology uh, you could allude to in, in a text uh, or in an opinion uh, in a newspaper, but it, I mean, I hope uh, it's much more powerful that when you experience it in situ, so to speak, that you enter it and then you see that the, the way the, the, the earth is actually functioning has nothing to do uh, with what you thought before. And that its size, its fragility, uh, its, its location of this little thin, uh, um, rib ribbon or, or film even uh, is very different from the planet you imagine and that you are locked in which is also a very good thing when you are in an exhibition because I mean you are in <laughs> there is no outside and, and, and that's precisely the point to be on the critical zone is not to see the earth from the outside so exhibition are powerful uh, ways to mimic to to, to to produce the feeling associated with the argument. Sure. And as you said, uh, since we cannot 
get out of an exhibition because we try to bring the visitors to that, get them out of the nowadays world, the moment of today and the space, the city that they live and enter a narrative, enter a narrative that they can uh, guide themselves in that space and trying to figure out uh, the different elements that we put in an exhibition and try to get the meanings out of it. At the same time, in your book, in a uh, more uh, older book of yours, Facing Gaia, you suggested that we are exactly in the same position as when Europeans discovered the new world and when cartographers had to redraw their maps uh, due to it. Four centuries later, there is a new earth to, re to rediscover, one that is reacting to our actions as humans. Uh, for that, you need new descriptions and you, new, and you need also new visualizations. How would you describe this earth in, in transition and how can we have a, a better sense of its, of its transformations? Well, that's a very uh, interesting and difficult question and we should uh, uh, all work together, uh, different museums or different media, uh, because of course no one has the answer to that. I mean, it would be ridiculous to say that I have the answer. Um, what it is to see the earth from the inside and not from the outside, for instance. Uh, what it is to see it where the notion of local and global is actually perturbated, because it's not just local, uh, but it's not global either. Uh, how to survey it, uh, all of these questions are, are different. We, we have fortunately a vast anthropological literature uh, from the people who have been discovered precisely um, at the time in the 16th century, <laughs> I mean, Latin America is, of course, one, one case, very important one, uh, who have completely different way of surveying and mapping the terrestrial. What I call terrestrial is the term I use to describe uh, the critical zone, so to speak. Uh, so it's very interesting. Uh, and again, it, it, I'm trying to mix things coming from the science and coming others coming from anthropology. Because the critical zone observatory, as you mentioned at first, uh, are very uh, important because they discovered the heterogeneity of the land. Uh, and it, it, it's not scalable. I mean, we don't look only for scalable uh, things which can be universalized. So the, to, to map out in this earth which, which, on which we are supposed to land, uh, we need different tools from cartography and geography, but we also need <laughs> uh, the sciences and many, many, many sciences. Uh, in fact, sciences which look a lot like Histoire Naturelle, uh, Naturala Historia uh, of the 19th century in a way. Uh, this is why uh, Humboldt is so important for us in the exhibition, because Alexander von Humboldt uh, mm -hmm so important for the Latin America, by the way, uh, offers a, a, a sort of grasp of science and uh, literature, uh, which is very well adapted to this landing. And, and, and it's, of course, it was dismissed because it was not uh, scalable, but um, not being scalable is maybe one of the characteristics of, of landing. And, and that, that has many, many consequences which uh, activists and uh, uh, militants and anthropologists are trying now to, to uh, unwrap, so to speak. Sure. Uh, do we have time for two more questions? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so the magnitude of the climate challenges and the scale of needed response to it may have ignited the desire of the super rich population to find or build places where they can stay safeguards if anything goes wrong. And it might, it seems that it will. Uh, even Mars colonization projects uh, has this leaving earth behind feeling to them. Yeah. Do you think that climate deniers movements are in part based on the illusion that some groups could actually leave the planet uh, to the rest of the population? How can we deal with that? Uh, with that diagnosis? Well, it's a, it, it, I mean, it's a complete illusion, but people like to be, to have illusion of that sort. I mean, it, it, it's a, 
as long as it doesn't destroy all the budgets for the rest of the sciences, I'd say it's rather innocent because it's so, I mean, it, it's so unworkable that uh, I don't think it's so dangerous. I mean, I'm much more worried by populism than by the idea that people can move uh, maybe at most uh, five people or 10 people to Mars. I mean, it, it, the idea that it will solve the billions of people on Earth uh, is, I mean, doesn't really uh, need an, uh, an answer. Uh, and as you said, I mean, these people are simultaneously uh, very cleverly building big bunkers in which they can survive on Earth uh, or buying property in New Zealand or whatever. So um, I don't think it's important, but it, 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 it actually clearly uh, show by contrast uh, why this is not a modernist uh, developmental humanist move, because it's just for very, very few people explicitly. I mean, the rest can just get lost. And, and that, that in a way clarify the situation. <laughs> if you if you say, okay, I want to do a big project on Mars, but it's just for me and my uh, federal billionaires. I mean, who cares? I mean, it's, yeah. it's so ridiculously uh, elitist, but it's, it's not a big threat. Yeah. Um, and I think that we have seen that occur in Europe somehow. Uh, and uh, I think that the left-wing parties also here in Brazil are trying to rediscuss their agenda uh, and their development agenda uh, here in Brazil, uh, because we see that most of the um, left-wing parties, they are being crouched as green parties or trying to get more the the sustainable agenda uh, to them. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, why do you think that this sustainable political discourse has difficulties to leave the superficial, to leave the superficial level uh, towards a more active engagement of the population itself. Do you think that they have to reinvent uh, themselves to do it? Well, yes, but it's also start again <laughs> their work of defining uh, geosocial classes, which is, I think, I mean, in a way, it's a very traditional uh, question, which is uh, what are the causes of poverty and of inequality. It just happened that the causes uh, are now much longer and include many other things than uh, being badly paid in a, in a factory. Uh, and that being in a terrible place uh, in, in a city or having no uh, transportation or eating uh, crap, all of those things are now as important to define uh, inequality and poverty than uh, the, the, the other thing that social movement of the past uh, we're trying to uh, uh, fight for. So in, in a way, it's, it, 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 it's strange <laughs> because, of course, the, the left was still a party of development uh, in the old Sovietic um, uh, attitude. I mean, even more abundance and even more factory, even more uh, chimneys uh, with, with smokes. Uh, uh, and that would be the way to beat uh, capitalism. And it's, there's still, at least in Europe, it's disappearing completely now. Actually, today, yesterday, we had election uh, where the Green parties uh, won many different uh, big cities in, in France for the first time. So it, 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 it's disappearing, but it's still in the mind of, of some, uh, I mean, a sort of uh, attitude, let's say, uh, of some of the uh, socialist party. But they don't have to remake themselves. They just have to continue working for the causes of inequality. I mean, it's, it's a fairly simple uh, program. And start the work, uh, which is true they didn't do, of uh, inquiring on those causes, including many more agents <laughs> than before. Because now the inequality are extended to trees and to animals and to all sorts of other, other things. Uh, and that, of course, slightly difficult for, for the traditional left, but there's nothing impossible. Yes, let's hope so. Um, we're, so we are arriving to, uh, okay. to the conclusion of our interview. Uh, I would like you to, to express your um, last words, but also to leave you with one last question, uh, if, you, uh, if you may to respond it, please. Uh, so since we are, this year, we are, we're thinking we are learning a lot. 
uh, not only due to this situation, but also to the connection that he has to the way that we are using the planet's natural resources and how that is also impacting us back and it might get even harder in the overcoming years. In that sense, what we, would you think would be uh, the message for us to, if we want to build and design a better process to manage a lower environmental impact society in the long term, uh, and in order to do so, uh, what are we willing to sustain or to abandon uh, as a society in order to react to the upcoming climate emergency? <laughs> We, we need another hour for that, and I don't have this hour, uh, or maybe a week or something. No, I've, I cannot answer that. It's too vast. Uh, the only thing I can say is that uh, it's impossible to answer it uh, as long as everybody has not done its own, um, I should say, uh, examination, so to speak, personal examination. That's what the, that was behind the idea of a questionnaire I, I mentioned before. Uh, because we are precisely uh, torn uh, between the idea of development and abundance, and, and it's good for many people because they are still in poverty, uh, and this other uh, necessity. So as long as we have not explored the, the, the consequences of this internal conflict, it's very difficult to, to work the external conflict, so to speak. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are uh, we being the, let's say, social left or whatever, uh, disarmed by the violence of the populist uh, movement, because we ourselves have not clearly uh, uh, explored our own <laughs> contradiction. Uh, so there is, there is, it's a difficult moment when simultaneously you have to explore the contradictions and, and also fight. Um, so I, it's, it's not an answerable question. I mean, not by me at least, but collectively, yes, I think we should. We should, and uh, yeah. we, we're doing all our actions to make people think that, yes, we can, we can do it uh, as individuals and collectively, uh, I believe that we also can, but we have to think it over uh, and do it together uh, in, our, in okay. our groups. So Mr. Latour, thank you again for your thank time. You. Your work has continuously oriented new perspectives for social sciences and broadened our view of the world and the dynamics of nowadays society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Muito obrigado também a vocês que nos acompanharam nessa jornada pelo pensamento de um dos maiores filósofos da atualidade. Nossa programação tem muitas novidades pela frente. O Museu da Manhã é um equipamento cultural da Secretaria Municipal de Cultura da cidade do Rio de Janeiro gerido pelo Instituto de Desenvolvimento e Gestão IDG. Todos os nossos projetos e programações e atividades, em tempos de pandemia ou não, só são possíveis por conta da nossa forte rede de apoiadores, patrocinadores e parceiros, como Banco Santander, Shell, IBM, Endy, Lojas Americanas, Grupo Globo e Fundação Roberto Marinho. A gente agradece a todos eles, mas principalmente a vocês que nos assistem. Obrigado. Thank you, Mr. Latour. Bye-bye. Good luck. Bye-bye.